এটা হুনা গৈছে না বৰ অ পাইছো পাইছো না এটা অ সকলো আজি আজি আমাৰ এডন এডন কোর্স এ জেন্ডার স্টাডিজৰ এই শ্রেণীৰ লৈ স্বাগতম জনাইছো আমাৰ মাজৰ উপস্থিত আছে দি আসাম ৰয়েল গ্লোবেল ইউনিভার্সিটিৰ ইংৰাজী বিভাগৰ অধ্যাপক ডক্টৰ স্তুতি গুছামী আৰু স্তুতি গুছামীক আমি নতুন কৈ পৰিচয় কৰি দিয়া প্ৰয়োজন নাই তেওঁ ইতিমধ্যে আমাৰ ইংৰাজী বিভাগৰ আয়োজিত কেবাটাও অনুষ্ঠান অংশগ্রহণ করেছে তোমাকে বিশিষ্ট অনুবাদক বাদক সমালোচক গায়িকা আর এগারী গবেষক আর আজি আমার এই পাঠ্যক্রম প্রায় আমি নথে আনন্দিত হয়েছো মানে ডক্টর স্তুতি গোস্বামীক ভাষণ প্রদান করবলে অনুরোধ জানাইছো আর সকলে বিষয়টি গম পাইছে আজি এগারি খুব বিখ্যাত এগারী লেখিকার বিভিন্ন ধরনের আমাকে প্রভাবিত করা মহিলা মেরি ওলসন কাফর বিষয়ে স্তুতি গোস্বামী বিতংক আমাক জানাব গতি মানে স্তুতি গোস্বামীক ভাষণ প্রদান করবলে অনুরোধ জানালো ধন্যবাদ দিবদা এন্ড গুড ইভিনিং টু অল দ্য স্টুডেন্টস প্রেজেন্ট হিয় আজি যে বিষয়ের ওপর মানে অকমান কম অল্প কবলে ওলাইছো সেখে হল মেরি বুলস্টন ক্রাফট আর কোয়া হয়েছে যে ইয়াত যেহেতু ইংরাজি বিভাগের বাইরে অন্য বিভাগের ছাত্রীও ইয়াত উপস্থিত আছে মানে যদিও ইংরাজি ভাষাতেই কম মূলত মাঝে মাঝে মানে অল্প ভাষাটো দুই এটা কথা মানে কম তার মানে এটা এই যী ব্যক্তি দিস লেডি মেরি বুলস্টন ক্রাফট ফেমিনিজম বিশেষক ওয়েস্টার্ন ফেমিনিজমর এগারী পায়নিয়ার বলে কোয়া হয় নো মেরি বুলস্টন ক্রাফট ইজ মানে ইফ ইউ লুক ইন টু দ্য হিস্ট্রি অফ ফেমিনিজম western feminism particularly then um, mary wilson craft figures right at the earlier stages of the feminist movement and um, however whenever we talk of mary wilson craft particularly in the context of feminist studies or gender studies the one text that comes to mind or the one text that is talked about the most is a vindication of the rights of women mane mary wilson crafter alusona jetiai hoy tetia tetiai hobatu koi beshi utshahito hua naam tu granthakhone hol a vindication of the rights of women but to confine or to only discuss about Mary Wilson Craft in the context of this work is to limit her as an author and to limit her as to, to limit her as a radical thinker of those times another thing that we have to remember is that no individual is created in a vacuum ভ্যাকুয়াম এটার পর কোনো এগারী ব্যক্তি ব্যক্তি বলে কোথাও আক ব্যক্তি সত্তা বুঝাইছো দিই ব্যক্তি সত্তার সৃষ্টি নহয় কেতিয়াও এভরি ইন্ডিভিজুয়াল ইজ দ্য সাম টোটেল অফ দ্য ভেরিয়াস কাইন্ডস অফ এক্সপিরিয়েন্সেস মেমোরিজ সার্কমস্টান্সেস এজ ওয়েল এজ ব্রডার সোশ্যাল হিস্টোরিক্যাল পলিটিক্যাল মেট্রিসেস এন্ড therefore whenever we talk about uh, uh, an indiv- uh, uh, about the thoughts the ideas of 
any figure from history from to whichever field the person belongs we also have to explore his or her or that person's um, social cultural um, lives um in fact uh, i just mentioned that uh, all to confine discussions of mary wollstonecraft only to a vindication of the rights of women is limiting her because before that she also wrote a vindication of the rights of man and yet that was also not her first work before that she wrote in fact she also a wrote uh, a novel that was um, considerably autobiographical so therefore you know when we talk about mary wilson craft as a figure vis-a-vis -vis the vis-a-vis uh, -vis gender studies then there are all these aspects that we have to take into account now of course it is undeniable that Mary Wollstonecraft is one of the earliest women radical thinkers of the Anglo-American tradition or of the west but she is not the first um uh, um like ami jodi like we can actually go back uh, to uh, to as far as the um 15th century to uh, um to this um uh, french uh, poet uh, uh who who was also um um uh, a part of uh, the court of king charles the 6th of france her name is christine de pizan or christina da pizano now she is a 15th century 14 late 14th century early 15th century um poet and like um of course when we discuss uh, simon de beauvoir then we will discuss these aspects more but then i just wanted to point out that even before mary wollstone craft there are figures from european from the history of the west who spoke in favor of women who spoke for women whose voices were assertive in their in their arguments in favor of women so uh, we have christine de pizan uh, of in the of the late 14th century um, early uh, 15th century uh, france then uh, then we also have someone called uh, heinrich uh, a german i mean of course um, there are others also uh, and uh, then we have uh, someone called uh, um a a venetian uh, you know a a poet a poet from venice uh, wh whose name is modesta di pozzo di forzi she had a pseudonym also the kitor sodmonam asile moderata fonte and she belongs to the 16th century uh, after that we can also uh, give the uh, we can also mention the name of um and brad street who is in fact uh, one of the most prominent of uh, women poets of uh, north america uh, and um, so she again come belongs to the 17th century uh, so and then we have mary wollstonecraft now again Mary Wollstonecraft is not the only figure of those times whom we can associate with feminism or whom we can associate with gender studies if we look at the uh, anglo-american tradition then uh, we can talk about someone called abigail adams 
no she is she is an she is an uh, she is an uh, she is a mid 18th century to early 19th century uh, uh, figure from again she is from america uh, uh, in fact uh, she is considered to be uh, one of the um, founders of the united states so we have abigail adams then uh, uh, we have um, who else we have uh, Mm, Judith Murray, we have Mary Wollstonecraft, of course, we have Frances Wright, uh, we have Harriet Martineau. So we have all these figures and we can actually say that they belong to, the, uh, they more or less belong to the same age. That is the late 18th, mid to late 18th century, early 19th century or 19th century. And when we talk of Mary Wollstonecraft, it would be, good to locate her in in that context and so mary wollstonecraft is as far as england is concerned she is one of the earliest uh, radical uh, thinkers female radical thinkers of england and she is influenced by the whole enlightenment movement now i'm sure uh, you know what the enlightenment movement is um, enlightenment, but um, the age of enlightenment, bulu quasi. So, age of enlightenment whole, Hutora or Uthora Hutikar, Europe or Eta, it's a movement of 17th and 18th century Europe. And in that, there were many, of course, there were many different ideas that were generated and that became popular, but um, reason and what we call the sovereignty of reason is one of the central idea central ideas of the age of enlightenment so and of course the enlightenment again traces its roots to uh, renaissance humanism but just to confine our discussion to our uh, discussion uh, to this context uh, i would just say that the, eight, the enlightenment movement is a movement in europe of in 18th and 17th and 18th centuries and in this reason was given a lot of importance in fact a sovereignty of reason bully koisil okay and um, and and such ideals like liberty progress uh, fraternity these ideas were uh, to, uh, were to be uh, or are to be associated with the Enlightenment movement. So Mary Wollstonecraft, like several other uh, radical female thinkers of her times, uh, who were her contemporaries, um, Mary Wollstonecraft also was greatly influenced by the Enlightenment movement. Or by the Enlightenment. And what is the significance of this? The significance is that, like her peers, like her, the other uh, radical female thinkers, Mary Wollstonecraft also believed that um, a better social, that means ch changes could be brought into society by engaging in reason or by engaging in uh, rational arguments that means reason would set people free from the narrow mindedness of uh, from of prejudice from narrow mindedness of thought uh, from superstition tarmane andhobissa hobo pare prejudice jibur thake reason is the way and the uh, and and therefore uh, and like i have already said um, all of these women including mary wollstonecraft they can be called um, heirs to a happy enlightenment conviction that uh, reason would lead the way to a better social order. Tarmane, rationality and reason or put reason on petty hisape lole, homas color, bohut jibur jibur ahua ase, ke ahua bur nuahabo, ba atorizabo. 
aru homas kon agwai jabo there will be progress in society and as a consequence uh, people like um, mary wollstonecraft and she was in fact at the forefront of uh, such uh, uh, such uh, arguments as far as women are concerned so uh, mary wollstonecraft believed that education was the uh, uh, means of liberation of liberation of people from uh, narrow minded prejudices tar mane he narrow minded prejudice bur ki ha trabo paribo hikkhay so and she really fought she really fought for equal opportunities of education for girls and boys so this is where mary wollstonecraft is so important for us because back then in in the 18th century we have this um, thinker this author who um, argues in favor of equal opportunities of education for boys and girls and why did she do it because she believed that education would liberate the people from narrow mindedness of thought from all kinds of prejudices okay um, of course um, from today's perspective from a, if we uh, assess mary wollstonecraft from a 21st century perspective uh, we would probably say that uh, that uh, such thoughts are a little simplistic uh, 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 because uh, such thoughts do not take into account the uh, cultural racial uh, political historical not historical but the cultural and racial and linguistic uh, and and economic inequalities um, in society particularly uh, uh, as far as women are concerned but then again we have to remember we are talking about a figure who belongs to much earlier in time a figure that uh, that belongs to the 18th century and because ultimately we are talking about the pioneers of 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 uh, of feminism and the and, and the pioneers of uh, gender studies so anyway so uh, mary wollstonecraft believed and she was greatly uh, influenced by the and the whole enlightenment movement but that was not the only uh, influence on her thoughts and on on that of her peers the second factor that uh, we can, apart from enlightenment the second factor that we can talk about Uh, as uh, influencing the radical female thinkers of the times particularly someone like mary wollstonecraft would be the french revolution and after and the american revolution in fact um, when the french revolution was going on for us we plus it hongotito hoy asile france ot tetia mary wollstonecraft paris ot আসে কিছু সময় তখন দুবছর তিন বছর কারণে প্রায় দুবছর সময় তখন প্যারিস থাকিছিল আর সেইখিন সময়তে একদম ফরাসি বিপ্লব মানে দ্যাট ওয়াজ দা দ্যাট ওয়াজ ডিউরিং দ্য টাইম ওয়েন দ্য ফ্রেঞ্চ রেভলিউশন ওয়াজ ইন ইটস ফুল ফ্লো ইন ফুল ফোর্স রাদার এন্ড তো দ্য ফ্রেঞ্চ এন্ড আমেরিকান রেভলিউশন ক্যান বি termed as this as a second major factor that influenced uh, mary wollstonecraft and her peers now why because you see again i have already mentioned that ideas like fraternity liberty uh, upholding the constitution these ideas were already circulating as a consequence of enlightenment movement and in these revolutions i mean uh, in french revolution for example uh, liberty equality and fraternity these are the three ideas that are the at the very core of the french revolution uh, although it became a very violent uh, bloodbath eventually but at least initially uh, or for 
form well into the French Revolution, these were the ideals that inspired and motivated the people. And in fact, um, initially, whether it was American Revolution or French Revolution, initially it was believed that uh, probably the rational persuasion, mane, uh, rational rationality, bebohar kore, ba reason, bebohar kore, zodi, um, um, blood bath blood bath could be avoided or some aggressive conflict could be avoided so it was believed initially in both these revolutions that uh, rational inquiry might be able to avoid uh, conflict direct conflict but eventually it was proved to be otherwise and so in case of American Revolution, also um, the 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 colonies they had to take up arms against the British, uh, but somewhere this emphasis on reasoning, on trying to use reason to make the opposite side, the other side, uh, whether it was the British in case of American Revolution or the monarchy in case of the French Revolution. It was believed, or the bureaucracy. So it was believed that uh, somewhere this emphasis on reasoning really inspired these early feminists. In fact, um, uh, there was a pamphlet war uh, in that Mary Wollstonecraft became involved in. Uh, and um, because what happened was uh, she associated or uh, patriarchal domination with political tyranny. That means Mary Wollstonecraft perceived that the political tyranny or the tyrannical rule that was witnessed uh, in America, in the American colonies or in France, that was equal to patriarchal domination or that was a result of patriarchal domination and so anyone uh, and and uh, you know opposing such patriarchal domination came to be perceived as a democratic stance <coughs> sorry sorry so opposing this patriarchal domination came to be seen as a democratic stance now remember we also see the emergence and increasing intensity of democratic ideas and ideals, uh, whether it is the French Revolution or in the in the American Revolution. So, uh, the emergent democratic thoughts could be aligned with issues concerning women. It was believed, hmm. and not only this. <coughs> Sorry. The third factor that we can actually associate in this uh, uh, with Mary Wollstonecraft, or we can actually associate as influencing uh, the thoughts or shaping the thoughts of Mary Wollstonecraft, is the sexual repression that was witnessed in the 18th and 19th century, especially in the 18th century. The kind of sexual, uh, you know, repression uh, uh, that was witnessed where, and also um, we have to remember that Mary Wollstonecraft was a witness to domestic violence in her own home and sexual, uh, uh, sexual repression in her own home. So because of all these also, you know, so, so the sexual repression that was witnessed in the 18th century also elicited opposition from the feminist thinkers. And Mary Wollstonecraft was somewhere at the forefront of such ideas. And some other, uh, of course, there are some other factors also that we can talk about um, that could be like, say, movement for civil rights and so on. Uh, but all said and done, what is important for us to remember is that at the very core, it was believed that rational analysis and reasoning would lead to social changes or changes in society. How? Because it was believed that through reasoning, through argument, people's mindsets could be changed. OK, so those who were of patriarchal uh, mindset and patriarchal inclinations 
those people their mindsets could be altered or changed through reasoning okay and 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 so and you know once again we come back to the point that all these discounted the social and cultural impact on, on patriarchy and racial also but racial does not figure in this context because we are talking about only a, 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 a white society and a whole white uh, system so ultimately it was believed that rational analysis could lead to social changes because it could uh, effect or bring into effect social you not know, a change in mindset uh if you don't mind can i just take a minute or half uh, i just need to quickly I'll, i'll just be back in in half a minute all right um i'm sorry so this is the broader um context within which we have to uh, or within which we should we should try to locate mary wollstonecraft and now let us come a little into her life because like i have already said no individual exists in vacuum and an individual is so much uh, a, a product of all the various experiences and memories and circumstances and of course readings that one uh, engages in uh, and uh, and when we look at mary wollstonecraft's life we will find a woman who was shaped by hardships in so many ways uh around the time that she was born her father's name uh, is john wollstonecraft edward john wollstonecraft and her, her uh mother's name was elizabeth dickson so now uh, around the time um uh, when uh, mary wollstonecraft was born um edward john wollstonecraft inherited some um, inherited a, a pro- some uh, property and and also some money and um uh, he wanted for a long time to um he for a long time he wanted to um live a more comfortable life uh, he wanted to live a more um a, a, he wanted to live the life of a gentleman farmer all right and he thought this was a good opportunity to live the life that he wanted but he was a failure in fact for so many years mary was the craft and the whole family travel shifted from one farm to another in search of better um conditions maybe and uh, therefore uh, um and therefore um you know um and therefore the money got depleted and as the money got depleted as edward wilson craft increasingly failed to kind of um, to achieve what he wanted to he sunk into depression became more aggressive and violent and he um wa- he was increasingly drunk and he started uh, beat i mean he's he was very violent at home with his wife particularly and also the daughters especially the wife so uh and then uh, uh as a young girl Uh, Mary Wollstonecraft did not have that many friends but uh, she um, her education came majorly from a kind uh, elderly couple the clares and she also two friends actually whom she may- met one through she met fanny blood uh, through the clares who uh, taught her sewing and all those and who also helped her expand her horizons of reading and after that at the age of 19 um uh, mary wilson craft um um left home in search of a livelihood but for a young girl of 19 without much education and without uh, any situation like they say um the options were very limited so uh, she spent some time with a rich widow called mrs dawson 
and her position in the in the house of mrs dawson was above that of a servant but below that of mrs dawson so she was very unhappy in it and uh, when her mother became ill she returned home looked after her mother after her mother died of course she stayed with fanny blood's family for a while and then she worked in ireland as a governess so she has all these experiences so by the time uh, and then of course um in um uh, when um in um, 1785 she uh, managed to get i mean she went to work in uh, ireland and then okay interestingly her experiences of being a governess in ireland led her to write a book called original stories from real life this came out this was in 1788 that she wrote and uh, this is a children's book and this is her only a children's book in fact in one of the editions of this book the cover is made is engraved by william blake so this was her book original stories from real life and um uh, uh, but before that, she also has some other publications. Before that, I just wanted to say something else here. That um, so around 1785-1786, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft decided that um, she wanted to um, eke out a livelihood as an author. Mane, now, remember, we are in the 18th century, late 18th century. And for a young girl in her 20s, um, without any um, inheritance, without any major pr property that she inherited, uh, because and why is inheritance important? Because inher a good inheritance secures a good husband it was said because a good inheritance was good dowry so for a young girl in her 20s uh, without much you know, consequence without any family connections not belonging to the upper sections of english society to decide to live the life of an author and eke out a livelihood and not only livelihood a life of respectability it was not an easy decision but it was a very challenging decision but she eventually succeeds to a great extent. So uh, from 1787 to 1790, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft lived in London. And uh, you know, she started working as an assistant to a person called Joseph Johnson, who was also her first publisher and bookseller. And uh, she learned German and Italian during her stint in London. And she also uh, got a job uh, as a reviewer of books in analytical review. And um, in 1787, she wrote the novel Mary, which is autobiographical. And uh, it is uh, so much of what happens in the novel is actually what happens in her own life. But before that also, Mary Wollstonecraft's first published work is Thoughts on the Education of Daughters. So, and uh, why this work is in, important for us or interesting for us is that not only is this Mary Wollstonecraft's first published work, Thoughts on the Education of Daughters, this came out in 1786. Now, this is a collection of essays. And this collection of essays, the argument that she offers in this collection of essays is from her personal experiences and that of her experiences as a governess also, because the kind of education she wanted to receive, the kind of education she could not receive, the kind of education she wanted to try to impart. And remember, she had also started a school with the help of her sisters, and it was a boarding school and day school. So um, all these experiences contributed towards her first published work called Thoughts on the Education of Daughters, 1786. It's a collection of essays, like I have said. And uh, the reason why this book was published was that Mary Wollstonecraft had to pay the rent of the house, the building that she was using. So in order to pay off the rent, 
she had to publish and sell this book. And after that, of course, um, 1787 to 1790, she stayed in London and worked in analytical review. Uh, after that, she and yet she did not achieve any major success as an author till that time. But uh, her fortunes turned, if we may say, her fortunes turned when she wrote and published a work called A Vindication of the Rights of Man, 1790. Now, of course, this was actually a response to a work by Edmund Burke. Now, Edmund Burke wrote Reflections on the Revolution in France. Now, remember, I have already said that the French Revolution uh, left a deep impact on Mary Wollstonecraft. And she was inspired by the revolution, no doubt, and especially by the fact that uh, the French Revolution seemed to symbolize the aspirations and the voice of protest of the marginalized and oppressed people. And in her th thoughts, or in her, and in her perception, the women, the, the women were the marginalized and oppressed ones. And so the French Revolution stirred her deeply. And uh, because ultimately it were the democratic principles that inspired her. Now, uh, Edmund Burke wrote Reflections on the Revolution in France. And in that, or rather, you know, and that in that work, he uh, sought to um, speak not against the revolution per se, but in favor of the bureaucracy. And to this, Mary Wollstonecraft responded in a vehement and almost aggressive manner. And that is how uh, the, the A Vindication of the Rights of Man came up. So the complete title is A Vindication of the Rights of Man in a Letter to the Right Honorable Edmund Burke. But Mary Wollstonecraft's attack on Edmund Burke was less was not so much based on Burke's arguments in his work, but rather on how she perceived Burke through that work. That means Mary Wollstonecraft's attack on Edmund Burke was more on the basis of her perception that Burke was supporting injustice in France. Tarmane Edmund Burke Francot for us biplover homoyot zi hoyasil hongkoti to hoyasil Francot he. Prekhapotot mane Edmund Burke homazat suri thoka onnai obisaro homorthan jonai se bolii Mary Wollstonecraft or Dharana Hall or tekhte same hitti the asalote a vindication of the rights of man. A e, e, in this work ekhonot um, Edmund Burke ko homalosona kori le aru kothor bhakat homalosona kori se aru not only not only that. She also, and she felt that uh, Edmund Burke was supporting, you know, religion uh, uh, in, in a way that was not democratic, and so on and so forth. And her attack was Imatra Quadore, Kothur Homalusona Korise, Edmund Burke. But the point to note here is that Mary Wollstonecraft's approach was more sentimental than analytical in this work. Um, a vindication of the rights of man. So, and this, of course, um, made her very popular all of a sudden because her response was sentimental. And you know, when she spoke, spoke as in when she wrote, she wrote in a very forceful manner. And she was fearless also, by the way. She was fearless in her tone. Uh, Ulayahil. As a writer, she came out as a fearless writer, Mary Wollstonecraft. And uh, despite the fact that her arguments against Edmund Burke are not well grounded in reason, 
it was the sentimental tone and the forceful nature of her arguments against Edmund Burke in a vindication of the rights of man that made her popular immediately. And it uh, attracted the attention of the readers and the journals. And all of a sudden, Mary Wollstonecraft was pulled into the thick of, um, of the political debates of the day. And she tasted her first success like this. After this, we have the more famous a vindication of the rights of women. Again, uh, let me just um, mention that the complete title of this work is A Vindication of the Rights of Women with Strictures on Political and Moral Subjects. So this is the full title. And the shortened one is the Vindication of the Rights of Women. Now, again, Jenneke Edmund Burke or um, Harry Connock, um, Edmund Burke or Jikon, um, Reflections on the Revolution in France, Tar Birudita Kori Takete, Mary Wollstonecraft, A Vindication of the Rights of Man, Kon Liki Sile, Thik Tenedore. Another uh, another work called Report on Public Instruction by Talleyrand. Now, there, I mean, uh, there was a discussion on uh, educational policies in France, and Mary Wollstonecraft again responded in a forceful manner, uh, appealing to the sentiments, you know, in a very sentimental manner, uh, criticizing report on public instruction. So that is how a vindication of the rights of women came about. So this one is a response and, and a, a reaction to report on public instruction. And a vindication of the rights of women was, um, it was uh, published in 1792. So um, now, in report on public instruction, um, Talian's there, he suggests that in France, and like I have said, basically, this was a discussion on this book discussed various policies that could be taken up, uh, you know, uh, could be adopted after the French Revolution in France. So one of the arguments as far as educational policies in France was concerned, uh, the one one of these arguments was that, and this was Talleyrand's argument, that in France, girls should be educated only till the age of eight in schools, along with the boys. That means boys and girls could go to school, but girls could study in schools only till the age of eight. After that, they should stay at home. They should learn all the either, uh, other uh, supposedly finer qualities like sewing, embroidery, and painting, maybe cooking. So girls should be taught all these arts at home so that it would help them in future. And this is what this is one of the key arguments of uh, a vindication of the rights of women. <clears throat> So Mary Wollstonecraft, of course, dedicated this book to Talleyrand, and she urged him uh, to not prevent, she requested Talleyrand not to prevent girls from getting education in schools. She says that to prevent women or young girls from getting educated because of the fact that they are women, it is against their democratic rights. So here, basically, the right to education is made equal to a democratic right. And in fact, Mary Wollstonecraft argued that women were inferior not because they were inferior by birth, but they were inferior because of their lack of education. Now we come back to this point I had made at the beginning of my talk today that as a consequence of the influence of the Enlightenment, Mary Wollstonecraft and 
of course others like her uh, and her contemporaries they believed that education was a means of or was a vehicle to bring in change in society and so here in a vindication of the rights of um, women mary wollstonecraft argues that women are inferior because they are not placed equally equal to men in society so because of their social position also women are inferior and also because of their lack of education and not only that even within education mary wollstonecraft advocated physical education for girls so that girls could be physically stronger now this was always uh, you know something uh, that was witnessed uh, where girls or women were not seen to be as physically strong all the time so physical education mary wollstonecraft argued was essential now it is also important for us to remember that what mary wollstonecraft says in a vindication of the rights of women are not her arguments alone that means even before mary wollstonecraft there was someone uh, uh, who spoke on these lines and ekor honor kotha kaunta mary wollstonecraft pratham gora ki mohila nasile tekhetor agoteo asile kunu bai je in fact likhit hoy goise je an enegwa kisu kisu kotha khali parthokyo to ekhini te je mary wollstonecraft e bostu kini boholai likhisile and the person uh in question you no know, the person uh in question here is catherine mccauley catherine mccauley again is one of the earliest uh female historians english female english historians and in 1790 itself now remember uh in 1790 mary wollstonecraft had actually written and published a review of Catherine Macaulay's book Letters on Education and and it was published in Analytical Review now remember Analytical Review was where Mary Wollstonecraft worked also when she was in London and so uh, in that book Catherine Macaulay has also said some of these things and uh, Mary Wollstonecraft uh, praised Catherine Macaulay highly in a vindication of the rights of women the only difference probably is that unlike catherine mccauley who offered her arguments mary wollstonecraft offered her arguments in a persuasive fearless assertive tone so she was a very forceful writer that way mary wollstonecraft and uh, as soon as mary wollstonecraft's vindication of the rights of women was published it be, it was widely circulated and it captured the imagination of the masses because remember this was a new voice it was a woman's voice who offered some fresh ideas some original ideas some radical ideas and mary wollstonecraft came to be seen as the voice of the dispossessed the voice of the weak mane ji durbol ji hokol tekhetor hokolor hoi jen mary wollstonecraft e kotha koisil ene kichu dharona prosolito hobole dhorile oboisse ei kotha tu ami monot rakhibo lagibo je mary wollstonecraft or kothor samalochona kora tekhetok upolunga kora lokoru akal nasile in fact some of the leading thinkers of those times including someone like thomas paine whom again mary wollstonecraft really used to look up to they spoke and wrote negatively about mary wollstonecraft in fact words like hyena was used mary wollstonecraft to hyena dore kwa hoisile likha dekhetor bishoy teneke likhisile i know likha hoisile so and yet there were a lot of admirers and supporters who respected and looked up to mary wollstonecraft so mary wollstonecraft's significance as a writer vis-a-vis -vis gender studies is also 
to be seen from the democratic perspective. That means her arguments in favor of women were filtered through a democratic outlook. And therefore, in her discussions, racial, social, economic, or cultural differences between men and women do not figure. And this is not blaming Mary Wollstonecraft, because we have to remember she again came from a particular section of society. She may not have been rich by birth, but she was not poor either. And she moved around eventually in an intellectual uh, circle. So her experiences as a woman were harsh in her own lifetime, but they were different from someone who might belong to the lowest level of the economic ladder. Orthonotic Jokhala Lal Bulizadimi Sao, he orthonotic Jokhala, he heard to Porjat Hoka, Manuhegrakir, Obhikota, Teketor Hongkorho, Hongkorho Soritro, Mary Buston Crafter Dore Egraki, Mohila Pranisit of Habe Pritok, Asile, Arukhekar, Nehoitu. Takhetor Alusona Burad, Mary Wilson Crafter Alusona Burad, he is a poor art hamazic particular, Puru Mohilar Mazot. He is a Tio Kothabure, Iman Hoytu, Iman Hoytu, Pradhanon Nepabo Pare. Rather, what Mary Wilson Craft focuses on, or what we can say that Mary Wilson Craft focuses on, is that the fault lies in the social environment. Hamazor Jitu Porivik. Hey, Abohoman Porive here a for the inequality between men and women. And if that is changed, if that environment is changed, then the differences between men and women would also be re removed. Again, I mean, and of course, uh, you know, she says, however, she says that uh, like workers who would fight for uh, liberation from the problems of their own social economic class, women should also fight for their interests. So this is, again, something very interesting and important um, for us as far as Mary Wollstonecraft is concerned. She urges women to fight for their rights. Now, this also, again, originates from the fact that she had to fight. She had to struggle and fight for whatever she achieved in life. In life. She did not get anything in, you know, on a platter, like we say. So therefore, she says that women have to fight for their interests, fight for the equality of sexes. And of course, uh, and, and so, you know, she, um, um, she, uh, she, she advocated, um, sim by the way, she advocated simple attire of women. So she, she herself used to dress in a very simple manner. Uh, as we learn from her biographers, but she also advocated that women should not, she believed that women should not devote so much attention to uh, to attire and all those external, you know, uh, aspects. Rather, women should focus on cultivating their minds, cultivating their thoughts, and also women should focus on being physically strong. So, so she advocated nursing, simple dresses, um, physical exercises, and a healthy approach to sexuality. Now, this is also something that we have to touch upon. Her personal life, uh, her personal sexual life, particularly. So uh, you know, uh, so these are some of her, uh, you know, some of the things that she advocated in her in her uh, uh, in her writings and somewhere because once again we come back to the point of how mary wollstonecraft was convinced that education was a prime cause of inequality between men and women and at the same time this inequality could be removed through education so this is something that we have to remember now uh, before i wrap up uh, a little bit about her private life. And when I say private life, I mean her private sexual and private uh, sexual life, maybe. Uh, in fact, unlike the public figure, Mary Wollstonecraft, the private life of Mary Wollstonecraft was actually not so illustrious. 
uh, her first um, the first time she felt she had fallen in love was in 1792 and she it, she thought it was love but probably it was not love as much as it not so much love as it was infatuation so she actually was infatuated by an elderly artist henry fuseli and of course she felt this was a platonic relationship she felt that he responded to her uh, you know uh, sentiments he responded to her thoughts he understood her and things came to a pass where uh, where mary wollstonecraft re requested his wife to allow her to stay with them live with them because she wanted she believed she, her relationship with this artist uh, was um, platonic and so she and her, this her beloved artist henry fuseli and his wife could all live together this was of course rejected after which uh, she uh, she uh, went to uh, france in paris and there she became involved with an american uh, in the person called Gilbert Imlay now this was uh, she again thought she fell in love she became emotionally involved she also became pregnant with Gilbert Imlay's child a daughter but for Imlay this was a, a brief affair and there are letters that have been found where um, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft pleads and requests Imlay to come back to her life and and so on and so forth but he was least bothered he moved on of course and then after that she comes uh, mary wollstonecraft um, comes back to england and then after spending some time in paris um, she uh, returned home and uh, after that and this was her last relationship also she uh, became involved in a relationship with uh, the intellectual william godwin who again is one of the most important uh, intellectuals of uh, 18th century early 19th century england so um, and and then again uh, they also had a very unique relationship and then they got married but it was a brief uh, they they were together for a brief while because um, mary wollstonecraft became pregnant again she gave birth to mary godwin who eventually became mary shelley the author of Frankenstein, and and soon after, around the time uh, Mary uh, Godwin, Mary Wollstonecraft's daughter, was born, she passed away, and after she died, William Godwin published uh, Memoirs of Mary Wollstonecraft. Now, there actually, in that memoir, Mary Wollstonecraft's affairs and her un no, she being an unwed mother, all of those things were revealed. And that really harmed Mary Wollstonecraft's image as a radical thinker and a writer. In fact, after, because in fact, a lot of her contemporaries who, uh, who were also feminists and radical thinkers, a lot of female radical thinkers of uh, the times, they, uh, you know, um, they uh, and and we can give the names of people like uh, margaret fuller for the example they all started disapproving of mary wollstonecraft in fact um, you know they started saying that um, uh, mary wollstonecraft is not a safe example for uh, women to follow or mary wollstonecraft uh, is cannot be seen and cannot be considered to be a champion of women's rights because why did this change in public perception happen it happened because of the fact that uh, in the memoir that was published after mary wollstonecraft died godwin revealed so much about her private life her private sexual life that uh, it dented her reputation decatur uh, yeah it dented her reputation and and the extent to which mary wollstonecraft came to be neglected in public discussions in public discourse can be seen from the fact that between you know 1833 1850 in fact after she died for a long time mary wollstonecraft books no you know they were not sold as much 
nor were they reprinted. So, uh, I mean, um, to to put it and so and of course, so this is where I would like to stop for today. But to to sum up, what we have to understand is that Mary Wollstonecraft, the figure, for in the context of uh, what we call gender studies is a very, very interesting, interesting figure. She is important as a pioneer, but she is a very fascinating and interesting figure because not only because of the of what she wrote, but equally because of the life that she led, because it was a life of struggle. It was a life of um, it was a life of uh, what you call it. Uh, um, challenges that she overcame through sheer willpower, through her sheer desire to uh, improve her circumstances. And she was a brave woman, for that matter. And her writings, they may seem simplistic to us, uh, you know, from a 21st century point of view, they may seem very simplistic to us. But the point is that um, she, given her circumstances and her times, is definitely a very, very radical thinker. And her significance, her contribution as a pioneer of uh, gender studies, as a pioneer of fe the feminist movement, can never be discounted. In fact, if you do talk about or read about three waves of feminism, then uh, Mary Wollstonecraft would appear right at the very beginning around uh, you know, influencing in so many ways what is called the first wave of feminism. Thank you so much. Oh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, now, uh, the okay. session is a uh, question and answer session. So I would okay. uh, request uh, students and the participants uh, to place their doubts and queries if they have any. So mem will be available now. So you may either ask in Assamese or English, whatever you feel it comfortable. Yes, so all participants are requested to ask queries, whatever you may have. Or they can also share their thoughts for that matter. Exactly. Why only queries? Uh, yes. It would be good to hear their thoughts also. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we I hope the students especially uh, found it interesting and uh, a little beneficial also. Uh, because I believe personally that you know when we talk about a figure, about any important figure, it is important to actually look at it from a, a slightly social historical perspective also. And that is what I tried. So anyway, uh, let me hear from the students. Okay, Sima. Yes, that's a that's a nice question. Remember, we are talking about the pioneer, and uh, I also would like to add that that is also why I wanted to talk about each about like the three figures that I will be talking about. I wanted to talk about them separately. That is the reason. So you know, Mary Wollstonecraft. Just think about some of the ideas that she offered through her writings. The equality, you know, when she talked about equality of sexes, equality of gender of, of the male and female, vis-a-vis -vis education, I think that is one of her major, not I think that is actually one of her major contributions towards this whole discourse of feminism, particularly that we have. Why? Because and remember, we are not talking about 20th century even or 21st for that matter. We are talking about 18th century, two, three, 200, more than 200 years ago. And there we have, and remember, public schools were not as easily available to all girls, all the girls of belonging to all sections of society. Please also remember that we are talking about England, primarily a country and a culture that has been very, very hierarchical from the very beginning. So a girl, you know, the term uses situation. So a girl without a situation, that means a girl who did not have, whose parents were not rich or who did not have a good dowry 
to offer you know at the time of her marriage such a girl had very limited prospects of careers either she could be a governess you no know, governess was someone who would live in someone's house or or else she could be a nun she could go into she could go into a monastery and become become a nun and these are or else of course if she got married that was the third and main option that we that girls had and this is true not only in 18th century for that matter well into the 19th century we find this and then we have someone like mary wollstonecraft talking about girls needing to have physical education physical education in their in the curriculum for girls think about it why physical education was necessary because girls had to be physically fit again the whole emphasis on education for that matter you know girls and boys should have equal opportunities to be educated because they are not inferior by birth this is one of the major this this equality you know this whole see the whole feminist movement for that matter the whole gen, all these movements of genders that we have all of these movements these movements they their primary objective is equality equality of all genders i mean in case of feminism equality between men and women so we have this figure mary wollstonecraft talking about equality between boys and girls as far as education is concerned and mind this in the whole discourse of feminism in the whole discourse of feminism in each wave you know we are we are at this point that we call the first wave that we would call the first wave but you come to the second wave you come to the third wave of feminism what are the feminists fighting for the feminists are fighting for equality so that is that is just one of course others are also there her thoughts on education are interesting but again you know um, there are many other aspects to it also um, so uh, seema i hope i answered your question um, and then then i'll go to nitu's question i can see nitu's question uh you know uh, need to uh, how does mary wollstonecraft's ideas on education relevant to today's education system right to equality of education again if we come back to that point uh, of course um, today when we talk of gender we have so many more genders that we can talk about i mean uh, when i talk of virginia wolf there are a couple, not only uh, male and female but there are some other genders also and 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 gender relationships i would like to touch upon but the point here is that um some of mary wollstonecraft's see some of her ideas on education are obsolete today and it is very natural but i think her emphasis on physical education it is almost like repeating my previous answer physical education or uh, or uh, or right to equal opportunities for education and the fact that education will contribute towards uh, ameliorating that means towards doing away with the narrow minded narrow mindedness and prejudices i think these are some of the ideas because that we can associate with not because remember uh, mary wollstonecraft was not was a teacher also she ran a school for some time although it was not eventually so successful but she ran a school and so she had experiential ideas her ideas came from her own experience and so you know uh, mary wollstonecraft uh, she kind of um, so yes so if we talk about the education system of today she did not offer a complete educational policy but she offered some ideas that do have resonance even today so that way we can say the objective of uh, education system even today would be to shed is to shed ignorance to enlighten people to uh, you know to uh, to establish some degree of equality and i think these are what uh, we can find echoes between mary wollstonecraft's ideas on education and today's education system okay thank you nupur okay um, and thank you seema um okay so if oh, well. 
Well, uh, highlighting points between French Revolution and American Revolution, that will be a totally different uh, discussion, actually. But uh, just know that in American Revolution also, there is a very, very strong French presence because the, um, the revolutionaries of the American Revolution could not have succeeded. Because remember, that was a battle. That The French Revolution is different, of course, because they're all the people of the same country the 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 common people the masses they protested and they over against the monarchy they overthrew the monarchy that was the french revolution but american revolution was again between the colonizers and the colonized although they all originated from the same continent of europe and you know racially also they were same all caucasians but uh, yeah, but the the uh, american revolution was it was an American war of independence. Now remember, American Revolution is, a, of course, it started with all these, you know, oppositions to the tax policies that were in, introduced by the British government in, in, in the colonies and the people refusing to pay the taxes and the whole Boston Tea Party, all of that happened. But it culminated in a full on war between the colony, the, the armies of the, the forces of the, the armies of the coloni colonized, of the colonies and the British colonizers. Now here, there is a very active and strong French presence. In fact, please remember, we have to understand, remember that um, if it, it can be said that if the French did not help the Americans with ammunition, with war, uh, you know, with information, and also with, you know, uh, yes, um, war ammunition to fight the war, it is, it is probable that the colonizers, the colonized, the Americans could never have won the um, American War of Independence. So there's a strong uh, French presence. But again, you know, uh, uh, there are many common uh, points, if you can talk about it. Uh, overthrowing oppressive rule could be one. Uh, then, uh, you know, um, because remember, the, the colonized America was established as a as, uh, as a country where all the people were equal, even on, if on paper, equality was is one of, was one of the driving forces, or an aspiration towards equality was one of the driving forces in the American Revolution also, and then uh, the friend in the French Revolution, the, the the core ideas are liberty, equality, fraternity. So there are all these connections that we can talk about. Shainaz, uh, chief source of an individual's education. Chief source of an individual's education. In According to Mary Wollstonecraft, what is a chief source? Uh, and how may this retard or promote progress? Of course, uh, I think I have already touched upon the fact that Mary Wollstonecraft believed that, uh, you know, um, if the social environment was changed, the changes could be brought in. And vice versa, we have to remember. So that means education could change mindsets, and those mindsets would contribute towards change in society. And that change in society is only possible when there is a conducive environment. So it is almost like a cycle, you know. The environment has to be conducive. That would contribute towards you know, all these changed mindsets. That would again contribute towards progress in society. That would again contribute towards creating a conducive environment. Uh, but um, chief source of an individual. Well, you know, again, one thing is important here. Yes, and I'm glad this has come up. Um, for Mary Wollstonecraft, a structured system. She was in favor. She was an advocate of a systematic education, as in a, a, an institutionalized education. Now, the word education again means the experiences of one life, one's life that influences a person, and also the institutional education. Mary Wollstonecraft advocated an institutional education for girls, for women, but she also was not unaware of Tarmane. Institutional education 
she was a strong advocate of that why because she felt that education was necessary in order to establish bring up the position of women in society um she i don't chief source of individuals education will you call it so as on individual or education or chief source they cannot be i mean forget mary bulston craft for that matter uh, i don't think we can have one chief source of education for an individual because an individual is educated through so many factors circumstances of life experiences of life the books that once one reads again remember this this is something that uh, i would like to say here uh, mary wollstonecraft herself was not privileged enough to have uh, the best form of institutional education but she wanted to impart that why and and one of her her education was so much from the uh, her readings of the books in the house of reverend clare and his wife who bor who lent her books and also uh and also uh, you know uh the fact that uh, you know she this is something i have to mention this before i go on to the next question you know mary wollstonecraft constantly tried to improve her writing skills so fanny blood her friend whom she met through the clares reverend and mrs clare she and mary wollstonecraft used to write letters to each other and through that through those correspondences she tried to polish her english her writing skills after that when she went to uh, as a governess when she stayed in ireland for one year she stayed as a governess during that time also she constantly kept writing and she you know, she was frustrated at many points of time because the uh, the family with whom she stayed as a governess did not treat her so well but she she kept polishing her writing skills so that was also another kind of education that we have i don't know exactly uh, know if i answered shahnaz's question but these are some things i would like to say okay madhurika uh, no 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 there was no dislike now this is very interesting okay uh, william godwin and mary Bo see of all the affairs that mary bulston craft had william godwin was like her intellectual match okay and it was not exactly a um, it was not a stormy and passionate affair uh, that mary wilson craft had with godwin but the point here is that uh, you know um, again you know uh, there are there are psychoanalysts in the early 20th century or mid 20th century who have analyzed uh, uh, this this act of godwin as as actually some resentment in the husband's mind towards the wife and all but it's not so much that it's just that uh, you know one thing before mary wollstonecraft died she and her husband did not live in the same house okay they lived, did not live together in the same house they lived a few you no know, quarters apart and they would meet every day the husband would come to the wife's house every day they would spend time but then Uh, Godwin would often go back and retire to his own house, and he has written about this. William Godwin has written about this even in the memoirs. Actually, he has mentioned that they used to they were husband and wife, but they lived separately because they both wanted to exist in their own orbits. He has not used the word orbits. I am using it. Basically, they wanted to have their own space, both of them, and uh, so. Um. and so uh, you know and but after mary wollstone craft died um, william godwin shifted to her house to look after his two daughters there was the earlier daughter uh, whose name was fanny and this is the daughter of imlay the american with whom she had an affair and then she has mary there was mary so but somewhere william godwin was deeply affected by his wife's death uh, it really made him um, very a uh, kind of um, um uh, sad depressed in fact uh and um, and he started writing about her her life and so um he did not reveal her probably because now you see these are intellectuals and 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 maybe he thought that if he's writing a memoir 
or if Mary Wollstonecraft's personal private life is is to, is to be talked about, his wife is to be talked about, he has to talk about her in entirety and not sugarcoat her. So probably that was a reason. Uh, Madhurika, I hope I answered. Uh, oh, uh, how can we? Uh, Barnali, you know, something I would really suggest. We better not categorize these authors, uh, these feminists, as this type of a feminist and that type of a feminist. We, we, have, we are just in the initial stages of what actually is to be seen as a feminist discourse. OK, so uh, and also, please remember, the kind of feminist Mary Wollstonecraft is is different from the kind of feminist Virginia Woolf war is and this is because of the times in which they lived the circumstances that they had in their lives the kind of exposure that they had all right and that again is different from simone de beauvoir so i uh, do not think you know and this is actually a vast area vast topic i don't think we can we can uh, are we it is better we do not try to categorize these figures into such watertight compartments. Watertight compartments, mane buti sana hoy No watertight compartments that ami compartmentalize no kori. Let us try and view them as a continuum, as a tradition. Uh, if you have read T. S. Eliot, or if you do read T. S. Eliot someday, T. S. Eliot is a traditional concept. He to point of view pray in fact kobo parazai. They you know. So I, at least today, I would not really wish to uh, label her as this type of a feminist, at least not today. But remember, we will associate Mary Wollstonecraft with the first wave of feminism. All right. So I hope I have answered your queries. Uh, and um, yeah. Um, anything else that anyone wishes to say? Otherwise, I think we can kind of wrap up. I think that's all for me, guys. Supposed to be. Um, we, we are almost touching nine, so I think, and uh, no more students coming in from the participants. So we uh, we'll conclude the question and answer session or the interaction session here. And before we conclude our program. Uh, I would like to quickly say uh, a word of thanks uh, on behalf of the Department of English. Uh, firstly, thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, this wonderful lecture. And we believe that we had a wonderful interaction program as well. And this uh, speaks volume about the lecture you just had, uh, you just delivered. So thank you so much, ma'am, for the valuable time you have in spite of your busy schedule you have uh, just taken out this particular time. So thank you so much, ma'am, for the wonderful lectures you had. And uh, secondly, I would also thank our HOD, Dr. Deepa Pukunbarwa, uh, for her concern about these add-on course. And thirdly, I also would like to uh, thank all the participants for the active participations. And uh, so thank you to all of you, those that have been a part of this uh, evening lecture. So before we wind up, I would like to quickly announce for tomorrow's club, that is 12 o'clock, we will have a screening of the film called Call Me By A Name. And uh, mm -hmm. at, evening, at evening, we will have uh, uh, the class at 7 o'clock as usual. So please remember, other participants and students, that tomorrow we will have 12 o'clock noon as film, uh, screening of a film called Call Me By A Name. And at seven o'clock as usual, we will have, we will continue the classes. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank and you. Have a nice Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much.